here. Time to make coffee. Yeah, now's a good time to use the bathroom, make coffee. Go for just a few. We're going to be watching this live stream here in just a minute and going from there. Have you seen the Dungeons and Dragons movie? I have not. Really excited about getting this game into players' hands and letting them experience this massive world. A main cornerstone of D4 is play your way. As a player continues to advance through the story and into the end game, they'll unlock a ton of brand new activities that provide meaningful progression, no matter their playstyle. Players will be able to keep progressing in the narrative of the game. Alongside that, the whole team has worked on crafting a variety of different experiences players can pursue. We're going to have an entire world of sanctuary for our players to offer. There's going to never be an absence. A little harder. I'm working on it. After the player has finished the campaign, there's a lot more game to go and participate in. They gain access to a special, what we call capstone dungeon that they have to complete. Once they're able to finish this capstone dungeon, they're going to gain access to the first world tier. As you complete the world tier, it will open up the opportunity for you to go into your next world tier. That involves unlocking powerful loot, new items, and more advantages for your player to have a better opportunity to end the game. Whether you're a fan of dungeons, PvP, or just roaming around the world, I need a beer helmet while I work out. I do. Adventure long after hitting max level. Hey, Jocks, what's up, buddy? As your character continues to grow in power, you'll start with. The yeah, this is the video we've already seen. Expand out into we've seen paradoxes. we've seen this video. A lot of the choice the players make are grounded on skills themselves and the fantasies associated with those skills. Paragon Board is a place where we're allowed to have a lot more depth, a lot more customization, many more options as you go. You can rotate they the release boards, this a little bit ago. so you can choose a different path. If you're like, I want to do more strength-based things, or I want these particular boons or glyphs, you can chart your path through it, and they're really a way for you to keep expanding your character and making it uniquely yours. Similar to the Paragon boards is the Codex of Power. It's an in-game system that holds the aspects related to the character. You Talks are I'm using a QB. dungeon, and they will yep. have a chance to drop an aspect that you can pick up. And what this allows players to do is take items they're finding in the world and make them more powerful, turn them into legendary items. It's really special to discover what kind of playstyle really means the most to you. Every part of Sanctuary is fulfilling and satisfying. Dungeons in particular are really close to my heart. Nightmare Dungeons are going to give the players the opportunity to experience a dungeon that they might have already experienced in their past playthroughs. They'll enter the dungeon with a found sigil that alters the playstyle and the intensity of the dungeon. Oh, red so sparkle more graphic effect. And they have additional objectives, and then they also have affixes. Line by light, probably the QB. Add a degree yeah. of difficulty for you and your group to work through. One of my favorite affixes that you can find in Nightmare Dungeons is actually Thank you, Strippin. Appreciate that, bud. portals will open up throughout the Gotta area. get that dad hat. just pour out <laughs> different monsters that aren't native to that region for you to also be dealing with while you're trying to handle everything else inside the dungeon. There's over 120 dungeons to play through and find in Diablo 4, and any one of them can become a Nightmare Dungeon. Hex. By finding a Nightmare Sigil, and then using Thank you so much, buddy. I appreciate it. Version of that dungeon space. Everything's a little darker. Everything's more difficult. It's going to add a little bit of a twist of flavor on your particular dungeon. There's some targeted activities in Diablo 4 that suit what you're feeling in the mood for. The force of hell are starting to have more influence. I do a Zwift section. I've never heard of Zwift. Interconnected overworld of the experience. And as the players are going into hell tide areas, they're going to find even more powerful monsters. And by killing them, they'll be able to gain these special shards they can take. Oh, I don't think Zwift works with QB. These oh, big that rewards are available at these caches that are found literally throughout hey. anti areas. The sky darkens and the rivers run red. Meteors fall from the sky and the monsters get harder. We really want to create new experiences for the players. There's one I really like called Whispers of the Dead, which you get from the Tree of Whispers. The tree are there Whispers QB games? I don't think so. I'll look gruesome, into it. But it's also something mystically haunting and kind of beautiful. The tree has a little bit of a grudge against our players, and it would like for them to go serve its needs. So I like her hair. So we're to go serve these bounties, gather different rewards, mm -hmm. different items, and bring them back to the tree in hopes that it can exchange you something really meaningful. Maybe you're going to go to the Fractured Peaks and take out some werewolves that are... Yes, we've seen this already. Town. This is The, the uh, show starts in two minutes. They're just replaying this. Or in a group. We really wanted to create variety for people to be able to spend time where they wanted to in the world. It's very cool the way it's been put together, and I can't wait for people to see it, to be honest. 
In Diablo 4, we have a focus on the Thanks, world of Sanctuary. Thanks, and Sky. there are parts of that world that we call the Fields of Hatred, where Lilith's presence in Sanctuary has begun to seep through and manifest these poisonous areas throughout the world. When players go to these regions, they get to engage in player versus player conflict. These offer opportunities for the players. It'll be interesting to see if they can actually pull this but off. There is a little bit of a catch. In order to get these shards back to town, I'm not you will need to purify them. Other players will definitely know that you're attempting to purify. I am not shards, convinced. So you better be prepared to fight if you're going to be playing any PvP and be prepared that you might lose some stuff in the meantime. Once they've got the purified shards, they can take these, go Has back to the they're buffing rogues because of feedback. Uh, I'm actually I switched to barbarian. Cosmetic items I'm going to play barbarian. Yep, I decided. People who really love PvP yep. and want So many people I know are playing rogue. I just wanted to do something different. So I'm going to I'm going to do barb. That's the way they want to play. They can launch is just the beginning one of the things we're really focused on is also i like the spinning and con comparatively i also enjoy the winning with after the game has gone live it's yep. really just going to be a way to keep coming back and experiencing more diablo 4 in fresh ways we're really eager to hear all of your experiences and just enjoy the entire oh strip it i'm the same way i wanted to do druid but then when i played druid it kind of sucked i just wasn't i wasn't having fun yeah i really liked barbarian but it didn't feel very strong so, but I heard it. I never, I never only got to like level 15. So, yeah. Hi. Hey, folks. This is Riker, and welcome to the next Diablo 4 Riker. developer live stream update. I'll be your co host. I'm a YouTube content creator and professional Diablo fan. And I want to thank the Diablo team for having me here today. We're going to be uh, diving into some professional Diablo topics, fan. And uh, we have with us like some it. folks who will take us through those. We have with us. Hi, I'm Joe Shelley, I'm the game director for Diablo. I feel like we watched a video by this Riker guy at some point. Watching us uh, here and keeping an eye on chat, please keep an eye on the cameras. If they start spinning end over end, you know we had a bad problem and we're not going to space today. <laughs> Fair. Okay, I'm Joseph Pipora. I'm the associate game director wow. for Diablo 4. Is that a rocket uh, thing? I'm Adam Fletcher. I'm the uh, associate director of community uh, for the Diablo franchise. Um, so Adam Fletcher! Adam's awesome. Riker here. Thank you again, Riker, for joining us uh, to be our our uh, host uh, for this actual live stream itself. And it um, soon, we did right? want to actually do a few quick agenda items and so forth beforehand. Um, just a reminder to everyone that Diablo 4 obviously is coming out in June is and it? you can still pre-order. Yeah. Um, uh, we do have uh, deluxe and ultimate versions available for pre-order or you can pre-order the just the base game itself. But the deluxe and ultimate versions actually give you early access. So uh, there should be a QR code on screen if you want to pre-order for deluxe or ultimate versions of the game. Today, though, we have a ton to talk about. Um, we expect this stream to Thank be you, about 90 potential. minutes or so because uh, we want to cover a lot of different topics, one being endgame, uh, the other one being some class balance uh, changes <laughs> in regards to uh, some of the beta feedback that we ended up receiving. Sorry, Riker. Uh, as well as the dungeon feedback that we also received during uh, our beta learnings uh, that we actually posted last week. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to stay quiet for most of the stream. You'll see me more towards the end. <laughs> but I will, I will pass it off to uh, Riker I'll to kind be, of start I'll his... be on Twitter the whole time. He's very busy. Yes, I'm okay. looking at chats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll be looking at chat because we will be doing Q&A afterwards. True. Uh, but I, I will pass it off to Riker because obviously, uh, Riker, you've had uh, uh, quite a journey in getting down here. And of course, uh, over the past week, you've been able to play uh, the latest builds of uh, Diablo 4. And we'd love True. to get your take and uh, kind of hear, like, how was it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So I've been waiting for Diablo 4 for since years before it was ever revealed. I've been waiting so long, I'm literally transforming into Deckard King. I mean, look <laughs> at me. So, yeah, when you reached out for, uh, for, for the chance to come to the offices, play the latest build, uh, then getting to come here, getting to experience it, getting to uh, talk to some awesome people who gave me awesome insight into the build, into the systems, and get to play with decked out characters, end game builds, seeing all the synergies coming together with the items, the Paragon boards and everything. Is he only coming through the it's left really speaker? Been a blast. Awesome, good to hear. Um, I know one of the first topics that we wanted to jump into yeah, okay. was- I was going crazy. Uh, it was like, like some, talking a little bit more about the, the world tiers and the capstone dungeons, I believe. Yeah, because that's basically the, I guess the gateway into all the other topics, right? Because we have, the world tier system is like the different difficulties and the capstone dungeons is how you unlock those and then get access to all that end game stuff. So I think we have some footage to show while, uh, Joe, you want to talk us? Yeah, about let's talk about that. So yeah, the, I guess the first thing we want to talk about here is 
When players are going through the base game experience, they're finishing the campaign, they reach level 50, they get to move into their first uh, world tier content, which is the Nightmare tier. But before they gain access to that, they actually are going to have to go through what we call one of our end cap dungeons. These are longer and more challenging dungeon spaces that have big like boss encounters mixed throughout. Uh, they kind of serve as like milestones players are expected to pass in order to gain access uh, to that next world tier. Now, uh, uh, Riker, when you were playing, you had a chance to actually uh, check out your first uh, end cap dungeon, at least as part of this test. Like, what was your what was your experience playing through this? Yeah, so the first end cap dungeon. All right, <laughs> I was one of those guys who was saying veteran difficulty is too easy, crank it up. So end cap dungeon. I think the first one it's recommended level fifty. I was level forty five. Thought I was a hot shot. Went in there. It was a humbling experience. <laughs> That's how I, I discovered that, yeah, if you die enough times, you got to go back to town to repair your gear. So hardcore players, beware. Uh, I had to learn, like, boss mechanics, study, adjust my build, and eventually put my tail between well, my legs. I mean, legs, if you're five go, levels under. Power up a bit more before trying it again. But then conquering it felt like a really great achievement. Very satisfying. Yeah, huh. these aren't really spaces we expect players to want to go and, like, try to farm. I'm surprised that they had them try like, that five levels under. That doesn't really tell you anything, really. players to pass or to gain access to that nightmare tier. Once the players actually get into uh, their, their, this next world tier, world tier 3, they're getting access to a few new features. We're going to talk about a number of them today. So you'll, you'll start to see that uh, areas of the world are going to be affected by the, the Helltide system. By wagging my tail? To yes. Dungeons. Uh, you're going to start to see unique items uh, begin to drop in different parts of the game. And then you're going to start to see sacred and ancestral items also begin to appear in world tiers 3, and then in particular in 4. Uh, and also, in addition I understand that he tried it five world, course, lower, but I'm just saying, trying something five levels lower and then saying it's hard is, doesn't really say anything. World tiers three and That's four my point. Monster can do more damage. It doesn't, that doesn't uh, mean anything. To be more aggressive. Uh, there's a number of changes. I'm much so, more yeah, interested to know what like it was the, like uh, at 50. Some of the changes that we made to monsters in world tiers. Yeah. You know, one of the things I love about the capstone <clears throat> dungeons functioning as unlocks for the world tiers is that you've got this... Uh, this ge the general gameplay loop of getting more powerful, optimizing your build, getting more gear, and then you have something that you're testing yourself against. And then when you defeat that, you move into this entirely new world tier with all of the uh, additional like systems and mechanics uh, and features that unlock. So yes, you, I am right you're here. really moving into a place where new stuff is happening. You're unlocking new cool stuff. Yeah, enemies are more aggressive, they're more accurate, they're faster, they're moving more quickly. You start to deal with the uh, with uh, champion uh, creatures, which are just more powerful means can show up in your uh, elites and be affected in certain ways. That's right, like, yeah. We, we, the um, the monsters um, have you know certain cooldowns this, between their attacks. This guy seems they so have, tired. Uh, logic for how they He's been up like um, 60 have, hours uh, a week working on this game. Have, some projectiles have seeking, <laughs> uh, so they can home to some extent. Um, and, this is a paid um, interview. This is a promotional interview. About how they yeah. group up. And Pro a promotional how they show. Which, yeah, which it's, to it's total PR. And so a lot of those different parameters. We're just looking for new info. As you go up in world tiers to make the monsters more threatening. Because, of course, the players are getting more um, familiar with the game. They're getting more skilled. And they're also getting access to more tools in terms of uh, new abilities through uh, uh, legendary powers or uh, even unique items. Mm, right? Yeah. One of the things we wanted to make sure we didn't do too much is it's, it's easy for us to imagine that we could just make the game more difficult by increasing the damage the creatures deal or increasing the amount of hit points they have as you're going through these encounters. But we wanted to make sure that the, just the world felt more dangerous as you progress into these higher world tiers. It, and that requires more, uh, more work when working with monsters and those, uh, those various encounters to kind of like create that extra level of challenge. How'd you do it? Uh, did you kind of determine and sense anything like kind of going from world tiers like one and two into like world tiers three or four? Oh, I definitely felt it. I you stated in the difficulty descriptions, I guess I just glossed over it and I just expected more damage, more health. Yeah, I know how difficulty works. But the, I'm I'm doing feel, oh, the world just seems more hostile, more aggressive. And that's when I realized, oh, there's a lot more at play in the increased difficulty here than just bigger numbers. Right. Like nice. what? There's one more thing I want to talk about with the No, to no, no, keep talking about well. that. Like, this what? Is the, I'm very excited about this. What do you do? Why is it harder? I'm waiting to have a lot of these conversations uh, and with the audience, they can kind of. <laughs> convey more! some of the, uh, the, the more interesting depth and complexities associated with some of the systems. Uh, so in World Tiers, we gave, you, you gain access to uh, new, two, two new sets of itemization tiers. In World Tier 3, you gain access to sacred items, maybe who appear for you. And then World Tier 4, you gain access to ancestral items that could be the drop for players as they're going through those spaces. Now, with the players leveling up from 1 to 50, the items that you're getting from monsters that you're killing are going to be, the, the power is going to be based on their, their strength and level. So if you are, you know, you're playing in uh, the beta and you're killing level, you know, 35 monsters for whatever reason, and you're going to be getting slightly more powerful gear as a result of that because the monsters are more challenging and they're going to be dropping better gear for you. 
But once you have reached the enemy's cage that, behavior that and mechanics that like enemies buffing as you're leveling up and you're fighting more challenging things, you're going to continue okay, like, sure slowly more than that, upgrade right? all of your gear over time. You'll find a ring here, and a helmet there, a pair of gloves. That's great. That's how we want you to kind of like get exposed to itemization systems as you're progressing through initially in the game. But once you get into World Tier 3, things change a little bit. So items that drop, you have a chance to be sacred. Not every item in World Tier 3 is sacred by default. The higher the level of the creature that you're fighting, the more likely the chances that items that drop from that creature will be sacred in nature, or also based on the kind of content you're completing. But sacred items, when they drop, can actually, they drop in a very large range in terms of the power that they can, uh, they can have. So you could get into World Tier 3, you could kill a pack of elites in your first dungeon in World Tier 3 at level 50. And you can get an item out of, out of that group, maybe it's a rare, you know, a rare item that drops off in that group that is you know, powerful enough that it could serve a level 70 character. So the sacred item tier basically is going to have gear in it that goes from level 50 all the way up to level 70 in terms of like the power swing there. Uh, once you get a little bit higher, it's a little more likely to get slightly higher in the range, but it's very likely you can get those really, really great drops really early, which we think is super exciting. We want you to be trying to like always be looking for like just the right ring, and it could show up like your best in slot ring for that uh, for a sacred tier might show up at level 51, and that might be the one that you want to hold on to for the entirety of that tier. I like you're, that. You're talking about <clears throat> okay with that when, when you're talking about these sacred items. The level requirement for this ring, for example, is not 70. Right. No, no, no. So the level, that's a great point. Is the sacred so above legendary? This is actually to be set to uh, the level at which you actually loot the I think item. it's different. So once again, we have trading in the game. If you are level 50 and you get a really, really great ring drop, that's going to be good for not quite your build, but like maybe, you know, maybe you're playing a, a bleed barbarian. This is really, really good for like a berserk build or like a big fury build. You know, and you say, okay, I'm gonna, I want to give this to, you, you can hold on to it. That could be a really valuable item to trade. Because it could be that it's, 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 it's eye power such that it's like really good for a level 70 character, but the, requ uh, the required level for the, uh, for the ring itself is level 50 because you've got it at level 50. And that's going to raise over the course of time. We think that's going to be super fun for players to chase. And there's more of that as you get into the ancestral tier, but, but that's not all. I think the next thing we're talking about is actually uh, legendary and unique items. So, all right. Uh, we've talked a little bit about legendary items in the past. You know, I, I really want to focus on things that we haven't spent a ton of time discussing, but to give a, a general overview, you know, legendary items in general are attached to, like, legendary powers. And these legendary powers are <laughs> reverse. Legendary powers are attached to legendary <laughs> items. Uh, legendary powers uh, basically are designed to appear on multiple different slots. So, you know, an, an aspect might appear on an amulet, but it might also appear on gloves, or it might appear on ring, or it might, uh, might also appear on weapons. These things have a tendency to be in a lot of different places based on the power itself. And we like this because it let players like extract aspects and powers from items and put them into other items that, that, that meet these uh, certain uh, criteria. It's fun because we want players to go and be chasing certain fantasies. It helps them kind of like hone in on certain kinds of builds and gets them excited about the potential of like kind of taking all these different Legos to, and kind of putting them together. Can I say Legos on stream? Uh, yes. Legendaries, yeah. Legend, yeah, legendaries <laughs> is what I'm talking about. So, the, uh, so once, you, once you get all of these legendaries together uh, and you put them together, that's gonna be really, really fun. So that's that's part of the fantasy we think of uh, of legendary items. Did you did you actually get a chance when you're going through one of fifty? There's only a certain number of these that are actually available. But when you get into uh, world tiers three and four, more legendary powers are available. Did you get a chance to see any like new legendary powers as you were playing? Oh yeah, I mean, I definitely got to see a, a variety of legendary powers. I got a certain number of drops. Drop rates didn't feel out of control, uh, but. You know, you guys gave me some pre-made characters as well that were decked out with builds, and I saw lots of cool synergistic powers that came together to really uh, make a build flow well. And I think my favorite power was probably on a, actually a unique item, and it was for the, for the druid that made your werewolf form your true form. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of people have been saying, hey, can I just be a werewolf all the time? Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, that's the next step, right? So, you, so unique items. So unique items only begin to appear when players enter the, uh, the Nightmare tier. So once you're in World Tier 3, there's a low chance that some of the, uh, the uh, game's unique items will begin to appear for players as they're progressing through the, uh, this experience. And they're very, very rare. You know, these are huge chase items and opportunities here. Some of them are really important for build making. Some open up a whole, whole different build paths and opportunities for players to go and pursue. These are things that are designed to be really exciting. Like what you suggest there when you have that experience trying to gather the, uh, the werewolf, you know, uh, you know the, the ability to stay in werewolf form effectively forever uh, with, the, uh, for that, uh, with that jury unique. Uh, really, really cool stuff. Um, and there's more of these unlocked Damn. over the course of your level progression as well. You know, I think I saw Shaco earlier there. In the uh, list of unique items. That's correct. Uh, Shaco does make a return, and there's lots of opportunities for us to basically kind of pay homage to, uh, to the items that came in the previous versions of Diablo, previous entries in the series. 
uh, you'll see a number of different items make returns. Uh, items like grandfather, Shaco, mm -hmm. obviously. Mm -hmm. You'll see a few, a few familiar, and then a few familiar favorites, and then more over the course of the game's live development. Also, this is a, a good way for people to kind of see the new, uh, <laughs> the new uh, font changes and so forth. That oh, uh, font does look better. The, the beta learnings that, uh, that that we actually ended up posting uh, yeah. last week. Yeah, yeah, we'll get more into the beta learnings later in the live stream. We'll we'll go over them in a lot more depth. But uh, yeah, absolutely, the font was a great example. I mean, I think uh, <clears throat> we added. We added at least 20% more serifs. Oh, no, that's to the hitting <laughs> all the <laughs> house. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. More serifs. Significantly um, more serif, yeah. But no, seriously, people pointed out that the font, um, while highly readable, and we there spent we a lot of time thinking about you know, how the game is going to display on all kinds of different screens, uh, different aspect ratios, um, TVs, right? And so we want the font to be highly readable in all of those situations. Um, uh, but uh, it didn't feel as much like Diablo as it could have, and so we went back and looked for a font that was still highly readable, but had uh, more of a Diablo thing. And you know, it's just a great example of, um, you know, players pointing something out and, and us being able to, to react to it. What's the uh, the next thing we want to talk about, Riker? What do you think? Uh, well, so we have all these legendary items. One semi-deterministic way to farm for them, Helltide. It's mm. an activity where. Well, I guess you can dive into how exactly you can target farm specific item slots to hunt for specific unique items. Um, and it's going to be one of the main end game activities that we'll be partaking in, right? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, once the player gains access to Nightmare Torment here, uh, they're going to, or uh, Nightmare Tier, they're going to start gaining, ac they're going to start seeing some of these new activities, one of them which is Helltide. Uh, Helltide is basically going to be uh, the switch where you, you know, as you're running in through the world of Sanctuary, you know, the sky turns red, blood begins to fall from the sky, new monsters begin to appear, Everything is more challenging. New like events are going to start showing up, and, and importantly, as you're killing creatures when you're within one of these Helltide areas, you're going to be getting what we call cinders. It's this new currency player able to collect while they're specifically within these spaces, and this is great because you get to take these cinders. And as you're wandering through the overworld, you might be running on your other players. Uh, you might be like helping them do events together. Everyone's getting their own cinders as they go. Yeah. Uh, you'll be looking for these Helltide caches. You can see here, and these are great to your point about being able to target farm for certain kinds of items. So every one of the caches in the Helltide zone is actually tied to an item slot. And they all have different costs. So you look kind of like you'll be gathering cinders by playing within the space, trying to locate one of the caches that have the item type that you're looking for, whether like maybe you're looking for an amulet or looking for a ring. You know, maybe you're looking, maybe you're looking for a Shaco. So you're looking actually to go find a helmet cache and you want to keep trying to go after the helmet cache and the rare desperate hope that you're going to get exactly the unique item that you're looking for, right? That's cool. We want to give you some of that opportunity to give you that opportunity to target farmer a little bit. But there's actually a little bit of fun there too. Uh, so one of the, the things that's like one of my personal favorite parts of the Helltide system is the idea that the uh, the player is the players uh, there's like an extra set of stakes, right? When the players running around with these cinders, uh, they have the chance if they if they die they're going to lose about half their yeah, cinders. I'm Every time they, they they fall, and they don't they don't drop on the ground. They're gone. So you have to be very careful about like when you're looking to overextend as part of the combat experience in order to like farm more cinders, get to the cash that you're looking for. Whatever that is, you are putting yourself at more risk the more you try to like gather and the greeter you get, the more likely it is that you're going to lose things. That's you, right. And there's a, a time limit on Helltide too, right? That's right. Helltide yeah. is only active, like the, the, the force of Hell only like arrive for about, like about an hour uh, during uh, when they are uh, actually active. And different areas of Sanctuary are picked for, uh, for Helltide Zone. It's rad jamming out. Yeah. It's around. So you need to make good use of your, uh, your power. And you, if you leave a Helltide Zone, those cinders are gone. You have, to, you have to spend them. So if you see that the clock is ticking down, you're getting five or four or three minutes away from the end of the Helltide, you've got to find yourself a cache to kind of deposit those things. Yeah, absolutely. My experience, I first jumped into a Helltide event with, I think, 23 minutes left on the clock. So I start by, okay, I'm scouting out the different uh, chests or... or caches mm. uh, to, set, to see, okay, which is the one that has the, the, the slot that I'm looking for, what are the different costs, and then I'm doing some quick math, okay, I'm gathering cinders at about this rate per minute, I have this many minutes left, okay, I think I could afford the, the most expensive, the weapon slot, and I got to backtrack to that place in order to get there, and then I died, and I'm like, okay, Recalculate. Are you docking tomorrow yeah. morning? Uh, okay, how much time do I have left now? And, okay, like okay, GPS, okay, so, so quickly, quickly, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I died again, and like, Better luck next time. Another hour before the next one comes around, <laughs> I'll have a better plan this time. 
Now, granted, you can still get legendary items dropped for you. You can still get really good drops inside Helltide experiences and while you're killing monsters. So it's not like if you Oh, did they finally the take my blue check mark on Twitter? Rewards. Yeah. But obviously, it does take a little wind out of your sails if you just happen to get jumped at the wrong time. Again, Oh, it's gone! I don't even know who I am anymore! Help out, help out <laughs> am I the choices. real me? Yeah, you know, one of the things I think is really cool oh, about God. this is that the... So the, these uh, chests or caches, uh, boxes with loot in, awesome loot inside, mm. right? Um, they, uh, you know, each time a Helltide appears, they appear, they're in different locations, right? right? So yeah. you, you have to go and find them, uh, you know, as Riker was saying. Um, <clears throat> but within, for the duration of that Helltide, they're in fixed places. So, you know, when you go into the Helltide area, it's useful to scout out and see where the caches are for the item spots that you're interested in. Um, and then you can you know, mentally remember, okay, here, I want to farm around here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to get this, this item or, or whatever. And one thing I want to call out here, um, you, know, you, you saw one of the caches on the, the screen earlier you know, in, in some of our video that we captured for it. Mm -hmm. Now, we did capture that with the, uh, with the UI off, mm -hmm. so you can't see the, the mm -hmm. icon above it, but there is an icon that says, in here, there are boots. That's correct. So you yeah. will know before you open that cache uh, what's in it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's not all. I mean, there's uh, there's other risks and dangers inherent in Helltide areas. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity for you to fight some like some different bosses. Again, like I mentioned before, there are different events and things that actually are going to be showing up. Uh, and uh, of course, we, we can't really have such a such a, a wonderful experience as Helltide without our baby boy, the Butcher, showing up occasionally and causing serious uh, mayhem and mischief uh, in the uh, the overworld oh. sanctuary. So lots of really fun things happen inside these Helltide areas over the course of the player's experience. And it's also an opportunity to farm a special crafting material, right? Uh, that's correct. There are craft materials like Fiend Rose and things that really are coming Fresh directly meat. from Helltide encounters and those experiences. I'm looking forward so to seeing him again. Looking to also get some of the materials you need for like really high tier uh, yep. like weapon and item upgrades from going through these uh, these places. So Helltide is what we're doing to farm uh, crafting materials in order to target farm specific drops. Another big activity that we're going to be doing, Nightmare Dungeons. You want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. So, yeah, Joe, do you have anything you want to talk about for Nightmare yeah, Dungeons so, first? You know, <laughs> this Nightmare guy's Dungeons like, can someone are, else talk, please? We, we, talking we like a mile a minute about, here, y'all. Come on. talk about uh, beta feedback at the end of the, the show here. Um, or near, hey, near Silent Osiris. Show, but, uh, Thank you, buddy. How you been, uh, dude? Nightmare Dungeons are a key dungeon replayability system for the later part of the game, right? Um, and you're going to get sigils, and Joe's going to talk a little bit about the sigils. But uh, we're really excited for players to get to check out all of the cool ways that the dungeons can really be transformed uh, by the Nightmare Dungeon system. Yeah, so uh, so first up, Nightmare Dungeons, very, very exciting system. Players get, haven't had a chance to play these in our betas yet, but as they get into the, uh, the, uh, the end game content, mm -hmm. start going through World Tiers 3 and 4, you'll begin to see, uh, you'll gain access to some of your first sigils, which are primarily initially earned by completing Whisper I'm not Dead, thrilled about the end game content being replaying being replaying stuff I've done. Now, uh, but if the mutators are, really are interesting in that enough. they are tied to a, a level when you find them, it could be which is going cool. to affect the, uh, the level of the monsters inside that space. Uh, they have various afflictions, which we've to talked a little bit uh, about in streams in the past. Uh, these are going to modify the way that, that that level rolls out. But Nightmare Sigils, when they are hey, activated, Thanks you, for the after you collect one, is going to basically open up a portal near an existing side dungeon. And uh, with every, in the pre-release version I play D2 of the game? No, I played D3 seasons, Endgame a little bit. You basically select a subset of Not all D2. the side dungeons of the game that can become Nightmare Dungeons for that period. So players have become, uh, become more familiar with a set number of these because they know that they can be populated with these Nightmare Dungeon experiences. So you might already know, whether it's Annex Claim or whatever it is, what the, lay uh, what the layout of a given dungeon might look like normally. But Nightmare, uh, Nightmare Sigil is going to change that by introducing these new afflictions and then also these greater afflictions. Uh, we showed our early oh, Osiris, this, thank uh, you, man. Yeah, I'm right super now, hyped for this game overall. A, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this hell portal, uh, nightmare portal that can open time up, the beta. Basically spawn in all these monsters uh, from other like monster families. It might not be native to that dungeon, which is pretty cool. And that we like, we like the idea that players are going to have to kind of deal with these new different threats than what they're typically used to as part, as part of that encounter. And there's a number of these other like greater afflictions, like we showed the. Uh, uh, Stormbane's Wrath, that, like, that I mean, Hunter, thing yeah. that's flowing around, yeah, behind, uh, around you and occasionally it just pulses out this really big, stunning, damaging effect. So you have to be mindful of where it is. You should make sure you avoid it as part of the combat experience. Definitely adds a new wrinkle to gameplay as you're going through. And we add more of these afflictions as the player continues to level up and they get to go deeper, the deeper to play into Barbarian. The, uh, the Nightmare Sigil system. Uh, Are going to do a Lilith cosplay? Maybe. And dealing with like, uh, more and more dangerous threats over the course of time. We'll see. And this is a, this is a really great place. Not only just to uh, to like earn experience and really push your build and make sure that you're uh, you're strong enough to tackle these sorts of challenges, but you'll also be able to. These are really great places to farm for like sacred and ancestral items in particular, 
And uh, these are the places that you're going to be upgrading your Paragon Glyphs. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking more about the Paragon system right now. So <laughs> this is what I'm very interested in hearing. That, like, this I want to know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm the them to sell me. Glyph screen. I just noticed, like, hey, look, it's actually up right now. What, what timing? Um, so, yeah, when the player reaches the end of a Nightmare Dungeon, they get to basically go ahead and take one of the Glyphs they've been collecting over the course of their 50-plus uh, their experience and basically uh, slot it into here and choose to upgrade it and make that glyph even more powerful. These socketables will go into your Paragon board and end up being some of the single most powerful modifiers. So this is kind of like upgradable gems in POE? Above powers, and even in some cases, even above some tree? unique powers. So it's really in your benefit, based on your build, to be choosing, uh, looking for a set number of these and upgrade them to exactly what you need them to do. They're legendary gems from D3. Well, not, I mean, and not the, really. Uh, I mean, the, so the sigils that we're getting. There's a locational uh, situation thing with them, too. What I notice is that if you get some afflictions... Gems are you know, just like standalone upgrades. We have the ability right? to salvage some... In that order one to looks like also placement matters and what nodes you have matter. Is that right? Yeah, just about. So if you'll be able to get a lot of these different sigils by going through Nightmare Dungeons. They are like the POE ones. They're like upgradable POE ones. Yeah, okay. If you're finding sigils that you don't really want or don't really want to run, because maybe it's going to have like enemies inside are going to do additional lightning damage, but you don't have a lot of lightning resist on your build. Maybe you want to go ahead and like salvage that back at the occultist. Take that down to its sigil dust and use that to basically make new random sigils for you to go ahead and run with. This is oh yeah, it's like Pee Wee Passive and D3 Gems. Further, they'll unlock higher yeah. level sigils they can craft through, uh, through the system over the course of time. And uh, just uh, it's another way to kind of like reutilize some of the sigils you might not be as interested in running from time to time. Yeah, one thing I liked about the afflictions was it was making me make choices during the gameplay. Uh, like two that I can speak to, the, the oh, yeah, Nightmare Dread. Gates that we were just showcasing. Let's say I'm in the middle of fighting an elite and I'm almost taking him down. I see that nightmare portal opening and I'm like, okay, should I take care of that before it starts spawning more monsters or do I finish this fight first? I'm forced to make a decision mm -hmm. and I got to live with the consequences <laughs> if I think, you know, maybe I should take him down and then no, the fight becomes more challenging and nope, I should have taken care of that gate first. Another one is, I forget the name, but it's, it's some kind of blood cyst that starts to grow, 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 mm -hmm. and then if you just don't touch it, it eventually explodes in a huge area. Yeah. And it's either, okay, destroy it I get those it on my feet every so often. Or get the heck away as fast <laughs> as possible. Again, um, making choices, and it's like, okay, I think I, I had, I thought I had time to get away, then I got crowd controlled, and then boom, one shot. So uh, I like how it changes the dungeon experience depending on which of these afflictions that you, you get. Yeah, absolutely. And there's death counts in some of these as well. As time goes on, you get into the deeper ones. Or you got to be careful. You can't choose to just throw yourselves at these things. And if you're making mistakes, you have to really evaluate carefully how you're progressing. Old age does that. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting older. That's true. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah, you got a chance to play through some of those. Uh, so yeah, Nightmare Dungeon is very exciting, and they'll go up beyond level 100 as well. Actually, oh, wow. so uh, this is this is a content type that you can actually fight up to creatures up to level 150. Actually, as part of the experience, based on how how far you're able to push yourself as time goes on. So really excited about how like how far. You say 150? Back. All right, now you're talking about glyphs and the Paragon system. So let's talk more about those Paragon boards. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Okay, Paragon boards. God. So we've uh, we talked a bit about Paragon in the past. You know, we've shown picture of the board just like this, and we've shown you things like, hey, look, like here's normal node. And this is the way that you're going to earn like five willpower. You know, uh, but that's not all this board is about. You know, there's a lot of other uh, there's a lot of other complexity and things to deal with in here. So there are basically four types of nodes to kind of like quickly uh, reprise some of this information. Uh, the first, of course, is normal nodes. Then we have what you show here is matic nodes. These are different affixes that you can collect over the course of time. Usually, they're like a little bit more difficult to find a direct like version of on items. So like something like this, for example, crackling energy uh, damage. So there's a so that's a that's a a sorceress of like a lightning uh, lightning spec sorceress uh, ability or a uh, passive effectively where uh, she'll occasionally be crackling out damage to uh, to nearby uh, targets. You can now boost that by finding this particular magic node, which kind of might uh, eventually unlock other builds for you to kind of go and chase after. But then there are rare nodes, which is on the next slide. And uh, here, okay, so there's a, some information here. Uh, rare nodes have a pretty powerful effect right off the bat. Oh. You know, and, but then on top of that, there's this, this bonus effect down below that you can, you can sort of see. Okay. Where uh, on this one, it is, yeah, another 60% damage to elites. If you reach a certain amount of dexterity for your character. Mm -hmm. So the point here is that like, rare nodes on their own, which there's about 10 or more per, uh, per board. Rare nodes are already pretty powerful generically. But then on top of that, if you were able to hit these thresholds for the, uh, for the stat requirements for these, uh, these rare nodes, that is going to make them very, very potent for, uh, for you indeed. And when you're looking at the board, these are some of the most, the most critical things you'd be thinking about when you're plotting your path 
through each board, which you, of course, there are. Yeah, the re the refund stuff is super expensive, and, and I swear to God, if they make it so you can buy respec with RL notes, money, you want to engage with the legendary notes or not? This I wonder. I really wonder if that's the yeah. game one plan. Other, one other bit about this, just because I, I, it's easy for me. I to really about, wonder if that's is the game that plan. you can spend in-game gold or first board. This might be the cost. But then when you're looking at the second board that, uh, that you're progressing through, those requirements are actually going to go up. So they have stated just to go like run from board to board. They have stated that the you can Bible stuff that is going to remain cosmetic. You spend a little bit of time into the board and pick the ones that you take really that, want. Take that for what it board, is. You unlock to get more rare nodes of, of different types. So they It'll said that it will never be pay to win and that it will be cosmetic only. So. The thing I think is really interesting we'll about these is when I, the, we'll the way that I look at the board, right? When I open a paragraph, that's their official statement. The first thing I do is go and look I at I think the, they did say there would be the boosters. Rare nodes to me. Mm. To, to but then they said the then they clarified the boosters mm. would be in the and free battle see, pass. So the, the uh, requirements for the I don't bonuses, know, man. And then I start looking at the normal nodes on the I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm pretty close to the dexterity required here through my gear. We'll see. Um, are there some dexterity nodes that I could hit on the way here that would take me over it? And you know how much <laughs> Don't you guys have wallets? Bonus, and then I'm you know, comparing it to the other ones and I'm thinking about that. So the the Don't you have a line of credit? Become sort of a path that you're trying to take to turn on these bonuses. Absolutely, and that's not all. Uh, there's one more node type as well, and then we're going to get to back to normal nodes in just a second. So then we have Here our we legendary go. nodes. So every one of the boards for each of the classes has a legendary node somewhere on it, and these are really, really powerful uh, powers. Like you'd expect, they are a legendary power, effectively unique to the Paragon oh. board system for that class and for the whatever the, that particular board is trying to convey as its overall build type. So these are really, really powerful things to go and collect, but they're actually not the most powerful thing. This is just an additional extra powerful ethics you can kind of apply to your character, but you kind of do this in concert with other things you're looking for, like I mentioned, the rare nodes. And I also talked before about glyphs, and we're gonna talk about that next. So when you, basically, as you're going through the board, there are gonna be these sockets that you can unlock, and the sockets are gonna be sitting adjacent to a number of other regular nodes. Now, the way that glyphs work is that you're going to put them into one of these sockets, and they are going to be affecting nearby nodes and also fueled by other nearby nodes. So if you hit certain thresholds inside uh, some of the glyphs, you're also going to unlock powerful bonuses. They're going to other always uh, also affect uh, nearby nodes at the same time. And as I mentioned before, glyphs can be leveled up pretty high. They continue to grow the radius of the affected nodes as you level up through certain tiers. So they can uh, affect larger and larger areas. And the boards are not symmetrical in nature I as you're progressing yes. through. Because the player can rotate their board and choose which gate they actually want to, uh, to uh, enter from, uh, you're, you have to like kind of choose from board to board which, where are the sockets on this board? Are they near the stats I really want for this? They said glyph? how many boards you know, will be this per glyph class? Will be fueled by, you know, dexterity nodes within range of the glyph, uh, glyph effect. And it's going to do additional like, critical strike damage, whatever it's going to do as a result. Uh, that's a really, really important choice to make. And because all right. the boards have different configurations, different socket locations, and different things near those sockets, you have a lot of interesting decisions to make about like where you actually want to invest your time. How does it matter? Like, how does it feel to do this relative to Can you to have all the nine of them? You might need on that board from, uh, from a different board instead. Like, fun decisions for players to make as they're going through. We want, we want ultimately to feel like the Paragon Force system allows oh. for, like, two, you know, incinerate, focus, burn type sorceresses Three. to feel like they've got very different paths to the Paragon board, different decisions to make, even if all of their skill choices are identical. Four. Yeah, it's something that, you know, we've talked about a lot with Diablo 4. It's the idea that even if you have, uh, you know, let's say incinerate is a powerful sorcerer build uh, for, you know, um, and, and you want to play Incinerate, mm. you're not going to necessarily be the same, uh, have exactly the same uh, loadout as another Incinerate sorcerer. That's right. One thing I found really cool about the Paragon system that I, I didn't realize at first is that the, every Paragon board is almost like a Paragon class, like a specialization class where it's all built around a certain theme, fantasy, play style, um, and it all revolves around that, that central or off-central legendary node, and then the, the, the rares kind of support that same theme, and it extends to the blues. So like on a necromancer, like, oh, this board is like the pure summoner uh, fantasy, and this one is the, 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 the blood mage. And looking at it that way really like, made it uh, very cool for me to be able to explore, okay, you know, I can merge these two together. Julia I'm says go, like, Paragon and, these nuts. And blood, <laughs> and just further... Julia! Uh, yeah, explore and, and dive into that. that this is a Wendy's! Yeah. You know, there's uh, 220 Paragon points that players will be able to have by the time they finish leveling up their character at level 100. Uh, we want those choices to feel like they've got meaning individually. Players can, uh, can respect them of those choices if they want for gold cost. 
Uh, we want to be able to play with this system and be able to like kind of experiment with different ideas as they go. But importantly, we want them to feel like that the choices they made for the 220 matter. Wendy should deep. sell almonds. We call them Wendy's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah super. I agree. So he agrees. Yeah. I think. No, but. Yeah. What are we talking about next? <laughs> well, I guess uh, at this point we can talk about some of the, the beta learnings. We had, uh, mm -hmm. we had a beta. The community gave a lot of feedback. And uh, you folks took in that feedback, digested it, and transformed it into uh, actionable change in the game. You want to talk about some of the things that were changed? Yeah, I keep saying we're going to talk about that. Now is the time. Um, so let's start out with looking at some of the class changes that we did. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of text on this screen. Uh, you oh, these were the patch an notes. Opportunity we saw these. You've been following along to check out our, our blog that documents a lot of the changes um, that uh, we we were able to make as a result of uh, uh, feedback from players in the the two beta weekends, and also um, from uh, data that we get. You know, we we get a lot of data. Um, f you know, uh, how many times someone dies in the you know, our necromancers dying a lot in this dungeon, or this boss killing barbarians a lot of times, mm -hmm. and we can use that uh, alongside player data to identify areas where there might be a uh, class. Um, I believe here we or, see there is uh, more spin and uh, more wind. Strong, uh, area, compared to right this, other things that are uh, balanced. This set of the notes same, right here. The same power. Uh, so I'm okay with that. I'm fine. In with general, that. one of the yeah. things that we looked at from. Uh, from I think those that's two primarily why I'm going to be a barbarian. Is, uh, yeah. Feedback that the barbarian and the druid, the melee classes, felt uh, weaker than the, the necromancer, rogue, and sorcerer. Um, and there are a lot of aspects to that. So you do 10% less nuance damage? Here, no, 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 no. For the barbarian, damage reduction. We, felt, uh, we identified passive that, damage uh, reduction. So I think they take um, less damage. At low levels, in particular, not dealing less damage. Um, needed more damage reduction. They're sort taking of less in. damage. Um, and so we added this passive damage reduction. Yeah. So you're just, you're just going to take 10% less damage, you just go. flat, no matter what choices you're making um, as a barbarian. And that's to account for um, some of the ways the barbarian has to get up and clo up close and personal with their sort of weapon heavy uh, spec. Um, Thicker we skin. also identified yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that kind of uh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, you could, could really benefit from some buffs. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, Riker, you got to play the druid a little bit. I did, yeah. So honestly, when I first saw the, the patch notes, I was like, oh, I was hoping the Druid would have gotten a bit more love with regards to um, spirit generation. Mm -hmm. But then I played an endgame build of, it was a, a perma werewolf storm druid. So mm -hmm. I'm a werewolf who's casting uh, you know, storm skills. And it, the play style was so tight, it flowed so well. Uh, it just all gelled together once you got the full kit, the full, the full build together. And... I went into this week with a certain class not really favoritism. Where I had rogue, I had necromancer, no, not really. sorceress, um, barbarian, and then druid in dead last. I'm completely confused now. I think druid might be my favorite now. Yeah, it's, you know, another thing that we did, if we take a look at the, the classes again, another thing that we did in terms of the melee classes um, is we took a look at uh, says, bosses this dude's lying and to me. monsters, <laughs> in particular their attacks that uh, deal damage in an area uh, where it feels I'm like there sold, wasn't man. a way for I, I just, the melee class to deal yeah. damage effectively while also uh, avoiding uh, avoiding incoming damage, right? Because a lot of times you'll about have Druid, the is it, for It felt like uh, a back of all trades that didn't have all the trades and wasn't very good at what it did. Getting a better position and, and doing it more didn't, damage, for, you know, damage per second. It didn't and feel good. melee class is sometimes choosing... At least in the beta. Taking, taking damage. It was just Jack. Um, you know, because... Uh, even with the case of a projectile, the projectile is originating in many cases from the, the, the monster and then traveling. So, you know, have, you have less time to react in some cases. Um, and so we took a look at, at uh, boss uh, abilities and, and bosses that... That's true. We didn't have the specialization. Showed, That's true. ...were much yeah. more deadly to melee It does make it, you know, hard to... some of those uh, abilities. Now, this also affects the necromancer really class. Um, because you might I know Arctic, yeah. notice that we had a note here that states that summon minions will die more often. Now, we want the uh, corpses to have sort of an economy. We want to have the uh, sense that corpses are useful, you're using them to, to bring in more skeletons, and the necromancer uh, pets, you know, as a theme of, of this sort of uh, bone uh, class, they are a little bit more disposable, right? Like if a skeleton dies, you just pop out another one from, uh, from a nearby corpse. Um, so we want them to be um, 
you know, dying and getting resummoned. And we want to make sure that there are plenty of corpses so you're not going into a boss and running out of, like, oh, I don't have any pets and I'm a pet builder. We certainly want to make sure that you have pets available. But we want them to be kind of coming back from time to time. So we, uh, we increase the damage that they take a bit, but we also, uh, you know, I was talking about areas where bosses were doing too much damage to melee. Okay. We also took a look at cases where uh, there were abilities that felt unfair for pets, um, where there was just like a huge damage in a huge area, and maybe it's no problem for a player to get out of it, but trying to uh, micromanage your pets to get <laughs> out of this. Micromanage an army of skeletons <laughs> around, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, yeah, that's that's not a fun gameplay that we're trying to, to capture. There's no paladin? With the necromancer well, that's probably pets. the so first expansion, that or monk. We modified the damage that those kinds of uh, 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 powers. You're going to have to pay pets. for that, playa? Uh, Come on, you ain't getting that for free. Yeah, we do want to make sure that managing your minions Come to some degree is, is part of the mastery of playing a necromancer. And that, like, you know, when, when skeletons go down, you need to accommodate that and make sure that you have corpses that you've been generating or keeping on hold for some of these situations. Uh, we we feel that that is definitely part of the fantasy of the necromancer class is, is needing to resummon, to your point, these kind of disposable soldiers. Oh, God. Uh, they're supposed to be helping you. Are they going to put the so paladin sure that to hold true, in a battle pass? Where, like, an necro can't go fight bosses, and let you pay to get it faster? We're trying to build with any of these changes, of course. Uh, we just want to make sure that the, uh, the, the necromancer does get, does get a chance to engage <laughs> with the mechanics. Now, another... And oh. I, I did get to play the, uh, the summoner necro, and I was summoning my minions... Regularly, so it was it worked something so that well was in Overwatch. part of the gameplay. But I never found myself in a position where, oh, I'm out of minions, I'm out of corpses. So the corpse generation rate was, it felt good. I, I know, oh, give them ideas? They already did it! It's not my favorite what do you mean, Stop giving them ideas. To direct them, but they already did for it! For what you uh, intended to accomplish, I felt you did. Stop yeah, giving so, them ideas. You know, one of the other areas of feedback, we have a note here that says... Uh, Stop reminding uh, that them. Okay, that's fair. Confusing. It says, we reviewed the class skills to confirm that... Um, there were That's good fair. options to get out of control impairing effects. Uh, in many cases, what we mean is unstoppable, which is the effect in Diablo 4 that clears all uh, in, uh, control impairing effects, crowd control effects, uh, and makes you immune to them for the duration of that effect. Um, so the, the classes are designed so that every class has, uh, is intended to have access to a good uh, set of options to, to clear crowd control so that there is an, an interaction here between, oh, you know, Monsters are doing crowd control, and I have options to remove it. But what I need what to think druid build is the kitten? Options. Impervious um, we saw feedback strike. during the beta that at early levels, some classes uh, felt like they didn't have enough options there. Um, Riker, in, in your play um, at the higher levels, did you feel like that was uh, still an issue? Uh, I don't remember it being an issue at, at the high levels of play, no. Uh, going back to my, my favorites, Barbarian now is my second favorite after being my fourth. Uh, again, yeah, the, the, the melee play style, I felt gelled really well with a, with a high-level Barbarian. It all came together. I didn't feel I was being punished for being in melee. I didn't feel constantly crowd-controlled or, or an inability to uh, gap close. You know, he had his, uh, the spears to bring enemies to me, mm -hmm. uh, the lunging attack to, to close the gaps, and uh, a good toolkit to deal with everything. Huh. So uh, the last thing I want to note on classes, of course, is that there are a few other changes beyond what you're seeing here. Um, I think, you know, uh, some people called out uh, Hydra changes. You know, the, we made a lot of uh, small changes to, um, uh, to classes. Uh, there are also some cases like uh, Legendary Powers. Uh, we updated Legendary Power effectiveness, which is sort of vague, um, but it's really just that there are a bunch of uh, small details and, you know, we're sort of uh, tweaking them. Uh, oh, the wow. other thing I want to talk about is uh, dungeons, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. So we got a lot of feedback from players that uh, there was a lot of running back in dungeons. Feedback. Um, and That's what they call there complaining. Were a, a, there were really two ways that we wanted to tackle this. Um, first off, There was a of lot course, of whining! Uh, if we have a situation where you're running back, ah! um, we have a, a system that causes uh, monsters to ambush you uh, to make sure that it's not just running through an empty space. Um, so we added more ambushes. Um, but secondly, and this is really the more uh, effective aspect of it, um, we changed the layouts of dungeons and where objectives uh, were located in the dungeons. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, look, look at this. <laughs> Graphic design is our passion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, <laughs> I wish that I made this this graphic because it's uh I it's did laugh so, really hard when I saw this the first time. So I love it so much. Um, but I did not make it. Uh, but uh, I think this is a great example. So this is... an. Uh, one of the dungeons that players called out in beta, Horfrost Demise, right, as mm -hmm. one that had a lot of runback. Um, 
And uh, one of the reasons that you can see here uh, that it has so much run back is that the objectives are laid out in a way that you have to run down a long, narrow hallway to get to one, and then you have to run back. It's, it's a dead end, and then you mm -hmm. have to run back down that narrow hallway. So we changed the layout of Horfrost Demise uh, like this. Right. So you can see that the, uh, the objectives, uh, which are those um, you know, diamond uh, icons there on your screen, mm -hmm. Um, are along the main path of the dungeon, and remember now, in this case, the player has explored all of the dungeon and you can see all of the map. Yeah. But when you're playing through the dungeon, you don't have, you, the map is, is fogged, you, don't, you haven't explored it yet, mm -hmm. um, but it's set up in such a way that as you're exploring through the dungeon, um, you're going to naturally encounter those objectives along your way, and so you're not going down and then having to backtrack a long way. Yeah, and in our objective view, this is going to lead to smiles. <laughs> yeah, this yes. is a good. This is good. But no, it's important. Like we, we want to make sure that like, as you're progressing the space, you are naturally coming across these objectives in a, a simpler way, as opposed to you need to like kind of like wander and kind of like backtrack a lot more as part of that. Yeah, and in fact, we we identified um, a, a number of dungeons that that got this feedback uh, in beta, and we also you know we were talking about uh, nightmare dungeons. We also want to make oh, sure yes, that Nightmare Strippin. Dungeons I, that um, happened to me multiple times. Have this, yep. We address this for Nightmare Dungeons as well because it's a key replayability system as we were just talking about earlier. Uh, this is another example of Cordragon, Cordragon Barracks. Uh, it's another dungeon that uh, we saw a lot of uh, feedback and screenshots from beta um, where you can see that the uh, objectives Robot, no, are not procedural. These maps aren't clearly procedural. Clearly you're going to have to run back all the, way, uh, all the way back through that long hallway you're going to spiral around. You have to go out. Uh, you have to explore out from those spirals, uh, and you can end up um, getting confused. Oh, there you go, running, Opti. Running okay. Because mm -hmm. um, the other thing that happens here is that if there you uh, run to an objective, and the that's good news. Next thing that you have is back along a path that you know about already. Um, then why wouldn't you just run back along that path that's empty of monsters? That's it's not fun. It's more fun to kill monsters, but it's more efficient than exploring some way, uh, some unknown that might or might not lead back to it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a key part of these layout changes as well. And if you take a look at the next shot here, you can see how we rearranged the objectives uh, in Cordragon to, to ameliorate this. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, these cool. aren't the only changes that we made uh, either. You know, there's some other things we did to actually just to straight up just regular objectives. Mm -hmm. So there's things like, uh, there are some dungeons where the players are asked to kill all the monsters inside a dungeon space. And in those situations, we've made it so like, once the players reach a certain threshold of monsters they've killed, rather than saying like, you know, there are potentially as many as 50 zombies in this cave. You know, after the player has killed, you know, uh, 49 zombies, they might still be normally looking around in the last corner where a zombie got like, is kind of like hiding in a closet someplace, right? In this situation, uh, instead, once you've reached a certain threshold of zombies that you've killed, now they actually begin chasing you down. They start looking for you in that situation, such that you don't need to go crawl through the entire space and explore every uh, inch of unexplored uh, area in that dungeon just to find the zombies. Some of them are going to come out of awesome those change. situations, which is that a is great an change. Awesome Maybe a little bit easier to engage with those things. That's great. Um, and then there's another one. Like there's, uh, we have features where, or dungeon objectives, where the player is asked to go and collect like anima. Which are just these objects, they like these uh, these motes of energy that drop on the ground when you kill certain kinds of monsters. Sometimes you need to go and grab a whole bunch of these things and then bring them back to uh, another area to deposit them. Sometimes it opens a door, might summon a boss, all kinds of things that we do with this. Uh, but in these situations now, when players are collecting this uh, this animal when they're running around the, uh, running around the dungeon trying to find all the, all these creatures and do these things, you're going to also gain uh, various buffs by picking these up. You're going to gain some resource back for your class. You're going to get some other things. It's uh, it's actually really great when you actually deposit these things. You're going to get a health potion. So there's lots of things we're trying to do to make sure that those experiences like help, like uh, speed you up and feel okay. great to uh, to engage with nice. while you're also going through a lot of the layout changes that Joe just talked about. Yeah, there. So you know, I, I, I'm glad you pointed out uh, kill all monsters because hmm. um, you know players rightly identified a couple of key problems. Like first off, uh, with kill all monsters, uh, of course, if you're having to go and hunt down one of those monsters, that's effectively backtracking, right? You're running through an empty yeah. space. And the other aspect of it is that the uh, sort of the intensity curve of like the excitement in the dungeon is is going down. Like you're running, backtracking through a bunch of empty space, mm -hmm. and then when you get there, it's not going to be an exciting moment. They There's need to take this, and they need to extrapolate this out to the entire game. Yeah. And 
you're going to kill them. Every single mechanic them, in the well, game should have this mindset. I guess that was a requirement it's, that I it's had to It's one off. spider. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's almost similar to, like, Den of Evil. It's great that they're thinking of this. Two feel and so forth. It's and awesome. Now them being able to seek you out and means less backtracking, less hunting in corners mm -hmm. for that one fallen or wherever. They well, are. yeah, and, and I, the other thing I like about it is that it increases the intensity at the end of the dungeon, right? Because yeah. you have the, the monsters at... You're, you're still clearing yeah, the last see, monster. Exactly. Now you have monsters running at you. Exactly. Um, uh, but uh, I feel like that would be the most interesting. These changes. Yeah. So this was probably my number one complaint about the beta was was the backtracking. Was I'd often in a dungeon at some point reach a point where I'm like, okay, I have to run back or I have to go look for a monster. And with these changes, I don't think I ever had one of those moments. Or at least I'm not going to say there was zero backtracking, but there wasn't enough that Word mode. Yep. it would have come up as an issue. That I would have complained about. I know some people, you know, say, "Oh, suck it up." Backtracking has always been part of Diablo. It's part of the game. Um, but like Thanks, John. the changes made hasn't made the experience linear. It's not like, "Oh, well, now we just have one quarter to go down." It's an ad. Uh, yeah, as you were it's saying, a PR. Like now there's yeah. if you do go on a side path, there could be uh, things to run into. But just overall, everything from an experience standpoint just flows a lot better. Um, I know with beta learnings and, and, and everything that we, we took in from the, the community and we posted on the blog, we actually had um, a big question in regards to dungeons and, and reset dun yes. re resetting dungeons and, and how that actually works. And I, I do want to take some time um, for, for you guys to be able to clarify a little bit because there's tons of questions. And yes. then we tried to clarify, and I think we made it worse. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're going to... Let's re-clarify think... the clarification. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> yes, so the reset dungeon button, right? Um, so we added this button um, er earlier in development when there wasn't a, an easy way for dungeons to reset naturally. Um, and uh, in fact, the way we added it led to some uh, undesirable secondary effects <clears throat> um, because uh, it was instant. It didn't care if you were inside the dungeon. Uh, it doesn't care if the dungeon is uh, partially completed. Uh, if you're a hardcore character and you're in danger, you can just press it and press out. Presto, you're okay. If you zoom in on the paper, the second to last square says "Made Beta." Added this uh, button. Right here. The amount of enhance for dungeons to reset. Enhance. Um, we've been working with our online team, and we've been making changes to you know uh, over the course of development, like how town portal works, how dungeon reset work, um, and so the way that it works today. If you are outside the dungeon, uh, and if, if everyone from your party is outside the dungeon, so if you're alone, just you, uh, and there are no town portals open in the dungeon, um, then the dungeon will naturally reset over a period of about 60 seconds, about 30 seconds of matchmaking and 60, 30 seconds of cleanup. Uh, or if it's partially completed, like maybe you got halfway through and you're like, you know what, I have to do something else, I'm going to go you know, kill a world boss, or you know, I, I want to do something else now. Um, then it'll, it'll take a little bit longer to reset. It takes about 150 seconds, but it'll still reset naturally pretty quickly. And the other case uh, here is that um, you've got maybe, maybe you're doing the dungeon and there's some particular objective in the dungeon or side quest in the dungeon and someone, uh, one of your friends joins and they want to do that side quest too, right? But maybe you've already completed it in this dungeon. Um, so um, you can also... Um, hop out of the dungeon, which you can use through the Leave Dungeon button, right in the UI as well. Um, it does have a short cast time, so... Uh, <laughs> not, not as quick, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's quite a fit. Bion Osiris, hashtag ad, dude. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, invite the other person to the party, to your friend to the party, make them leader, hop in, you'll get a fresh dungeon as well. Gotta remember. Yeah, so hopefully that clarifies, you can still reset, you, like, resetting dungeons is still a thing. Uh, in D4, it's just we removed the button essentially, so uh, you would just have to wait a little bit longer for the dungeons it's themselves to, to reset. And I, I did want to go over two um, un uh, or like or two specific changes that are we we also uh, obtained through beta that we didn't actually record on the blog. One you actually tweeted about, which was um, uh, about uh, ultra wide screens yes. and being able to control cast. Uh, distance and so forth, uh, and with specific abilities and whatnot. So uh, people who are using ultra wide or mega ultra wide screens, like wouldn't be able to uh, essentially cast to the furthest corner of their their screen, 
uh, and be able to use abilities in that type of way. Um, and then one other thing that we did notice during beta, uh, which was uh, world boss encounters and how players would actually complete a world boss encounter and then go back to town and then find another way of being able to, in that same window, go through another world boss encounter to, right. to obtain um, multiple opportunities of, of, of grabbing loot, which is something that we also uh, did address uh, through the, uh, the beta learnings that we, we received from players. So That's true. Now, I'll point out that um, the first uh, time you kill a world boss in a week, you are going to get more loot than you'll get on subsequent times. So there's additional incentive to, like, like there's, there's less incentive to try to, like, find a way to, like, kill the same world boss ten times. But yeah. you certainly will get some rewards for yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's not the exact rewards or, uh, or a clone of the rewards that you got from the first kill themselves. Um, great. Uh, I know we, we ended up learning uh, a ton from the community um, in regards to the beta. Uh, obviously, you guys got to hear a little bit about uh, the uh, end game uh, systems within Diablo 4. Um, we do have a cool... What's is this? it time for a surprise? Is it time for a surprise? It is time for a surprise. Um, oh, it, wait, if, what? If, if, if you've been oh. uh, hiding on the wait, internet what? and have not seen Rod Ferguson make very, very uh, uh, nonchalant tweets about this. Oh. <laughs> um, this is the and more. This is the and more oh. of the, the actual um, uh, uh, broadcast, I would say. Oh. Uh, so uh, happy to announce that um, we've been hearing a lot of feedback from players about wanting to uh, experience more Diablo 4 and, and check it out, you know, uh, before the, the, the game's release in June. And so on May 12th through May 14th, we are going to be hosting a Server Slam event uh, where all players within Diablo 4, or who want to play Diablo 4, can jump in and actually uh, check out the game again. Uh, this is a really important weekend for the team and the dev team here because we need as many people oh, uh, to be really log in, and check beta? out Diablo 4, and play through the game uh, uh, because we need to test out our servers some more uh, before we actually launch. Um, Joe, I know you 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 have a lot of uh, like uh, uh, want and need and emphasis towards yeah. this specific weekend, so be curious to hear. Yeah, so first off, you know, uh, all of the changes that we just talked about in this live stream will be in place on the server slam. Yeah, so huge news right there where if you want to check out any of the, the changes that we made from beta, you will be able to actually check them out uh, this, that weekend on May 12th or May 14th. That's right. And the other thing I want to point out is that we recently announced that, we went, that we've gone gold, that Diablo 4 has gone gold. And uh, that means that, uh, and that's, we got all of those changes from the betas in. We did uh, tons of, um, you know, server, we learned a ton of stuff uh, in terms of our servers, in terms of server configuration, um, making sure that we were fixing bugs. We deployed hotfixes during those two weekends. Um, and, and so we were able to really uh, improve our confidence for, what does gold you know, mean? for launch. Through that, and that's why it means that uh, they're that know, they're essentially we, done for release. So the release version is done. Gone gold. Now, the purpose of this weekend like just is to slam those servers, right? Mm -hmm. Really make sure that everything is exactly perfect for launch, because that's really what's important to us, right? We want players to have a good experience Feature on complete. day one when the game launches. It means a lot less these days you know, than it used to. Uh, but so yes, yeah. come slam our servers now. Yeah. Of course, this is very helpful for us because uh, and. It's helpful if you want to play on day one. It helpful, it's helpful, it's helpful for helpful the Diablo to 4 community but, to come help us <laughs> slam our servers, but... That's not, all your, that's not the only reason to do it. Um, when you participate in the Diablo 4 service, oh, no. you're going to have another chance uh, to earn the rewards uh, right. from the first two beta weekends. So if you didn't get a chance to play... Uh, these, because none of these are new, are they? ...or for any other reason, um, you have another chance to get your beta wolf pack cosmetic um, and the two uh, titles mm -hmm. no. um, okay and in addition to that um, we've you know for this server slam weekend we're set we've set the level cap to level 20 mm -hmm. we've um, adjusted the legendary drop rates to be consistent with what you'll see on live oh so they lowered uh, it rather than the inflated drop rates that we had in the first two beta weekends uh, which were there to make sure that we got plenty of testing on our legendary powers and uh, on top of that, um, you're going to have uh, 48 hours in the, to, to slam these servers, right? Now, during this time, 
a Shava is going to spawn starting about 24 hours after yeah, the servers uh, go up. Kind of cool. And then every three hours after that. So you can have, uh, I think it's nine opportunities to fight a Shava. Now, if you get to level 20 and you kill a Shava while you are level 20, so max level in this test, in this period of time. What level is it though? 20. It's 20. So you got to be level 20? <laughs> yeah. To get don't, the, don't show up in the Shava at level 5 and think you're going to get this. Uh, yeah, expect you'll get the, the, <clears throat> right. the reward. But yeah. what you're going to get is this Cry of a Shava mount trophy, which is uh, exclusive to this uh, Service Slam weekend. You can see it here on uh, on your screens. Yeah, the trophy there and the, that horse's hip on the saddle there. Very nice. Oh, wow, that's really that's bigger than I thought it was going to yeah, be. Yeah, that's you, awesome. We basically oh cut a horn. Part of a Shava's horn yeah. off, and you know, you know, made it added some gilding and, and some some nice metal work there. Um, and of course, uh, mount trophies in Diablo are uh, cosmetic customizations that you can add to your Dang mount it. along with mount armor. I'm gonna have to I'm um, gonna have to get a so barbarian a, to twenty a and kill a shot. It mounts some trophies mount on the saddle. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm pointing to my shoulder. <laughs> This is where the shadows go, apparently. Yeah. Um, or they can mount uh, on the side on the horse's flank, like you see here uh, yeah. with this trophy. Yeah. So uh, again, like all rewards from the original uh, first two weekends of the beta, including the two titles and the beta wolf pack, will be available, as well as the uh, cry of Ashava mount trophy. Ashava is the world boss. Um, and yeah. for the mount trophy, you have to be level twenty and kill Ashava. All classes will be available. Um, and you'll be able to explore Fractured Peaks again uh, from the uh, two beta weekends that we had beforehand. And of course, a Shava will be I spawning really wish much more often in this. They would have put in uh, NPCs in the weekend. city for players to actually let jump Barb in and, Druid and get their obtain the rewards. Minutes. And really help us out, help out the I'm team, about that. Uh, and make sure that we have a smooth launch for Diablo 4 come June. So uh, huge news and, uh, for all of this. And we will have a blog that will be going either live right now, or live immediately after the broadcast uh, for players to actually read about all this information. And that will be available on uh, Diablo4.com. So make sure to uh, check out the blog, get all your information there, and uh, jump in on our, our Server Slam weekend, March 12th through March 14th. It's another opportunity Are there any to, big games to around play that time? Diablo 4 March 12th launch, through March 14th? Which is really great. Uh, and you can miss all the, the new beta changes, which is Zelda. really cool. And one other thing that I do want to know for oh. these PC players uh, who are jumping into the Server Slam weekend. It's um, that little one. The, yeah. the, the team that here it? has done some yeah, okay. massive work on some of the PC optimization from the first two uh, uh, beta weekends. Um, uh, DLSS3 uh, for, uh, for NVIDIA cards will also be available uh, for uh, people to try out in uh, the Server Slam weekends. Uh, or a server slam weekend weekend <laughs> sorry there's only one i don't want to <laughs> i don't want to like set expectations or anything um but uh, there's more graphic options and optimizations and so forth for pc players to check out uh so uh yeah looking forward to everyone uh really hitting the servers and and really helping out with the game um we do want to jump into q a because we always end with q a um Riker actually uh, has a bunch of questions that he was asking his own community uh, that we will most definitely go through as well. And then we're also going to be grabbing some questions here from chat and so forth. Um, one question that we have been seeing uh, that has like come up within the community beforehand, and we'll start off with this one, uh, which is like, how long will it take us to get through the battle pass? It's a question that a lot of people in the community have been talking about over the last week, week and a half. And I know that we wanted to talk about it a little bit more here. Yeah, I think that there's a, so I've talked a little bit about this in the past, uh, but I, I think one thing I really want to emphasize is that when, when we think about the battle pass for the uh, for, for Diablo 4 uh, after the game ships, I mean, we're looking at our, 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 our seasonal uh, players, uh, we want to make sure that the players who are going through the battle pass, they're going to have a lot of content to consume, like outside the battle pass. They'll, they're not likely going to finish everything in the battle pass before they finish all of the content within a season, season to season. You know, so there's, there's a ton of things to look forward to. We want to make sure that the battle pass as a result is balanced in such a way that players of all types and all play styles are going to be able to get a chance to actually complete this uh, the, uh, this battle pass over the course of time. Our goal is like if you if you want to start to engage with this, we want to make sure that you are compelled to go through all of it as you're playing and just having a good time getting all of these rewards. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, what? Riker, I know you have questions. I want to make sure that you get some questions in and so Wait, was forth. that was that the uh, answer? And I guess we'll just go back and forth for this. I, it'll make it easier. That was so uh, for, much for nothing. These two guys, for you guys. <laughs> keep doing this. Yeah, exactly. Just keep, keep, keep doing that. That was yeah, like the most great. corpo answer uh, well, so ever. First off, I, something that you were, I think, touching upon earlier. So how long is the battle pass? I, I uh, but I, yes. I think, 
On the topic of Nightmare Dungeons, it sounds like every season okay, next there's going to be a rotation of 30 dungeons Great. that can Great. be turned into mm. the Nightmare They've Dungeons. They've said 80 right? hours. So we want to make sure that we get a hours. subset of the dungeons we have in the overall game. There's over 150 Assuming or so super like, side dungeons yeah. for, uh, available for in the baseline Diablo 4 experience. We want to take a subset of those each season. The exact number we're working on is going to be... We're One hour per day for about three but, months. Uh, but, a number of those we rotate every season to make sure that we are highlighting different kinds of objectives, different sorts of layouts, different monster families, d just different experiences. And we also don't want players to feel that they're going to have this uh, where they have to be thinking about, you know, all 115 different dungeons every season, every time with regard to this system in particular. So that is the idea is we do want to rotate through these from season to season while we're looking to introduce other ideas. Yeah. Cool. Um, it, I got a question here from, uh, I, I'm not going to butcher Twitch names, guys. <laughs> I, do, I do this every stream. From a Twitch um, user. From a Twitch user in <laughs> chat. Uh, do you have any plans to keep interest for people who don't plan to play in seasons? So we are going to be making, on a regular basis, part of our live updates. We're not quite ready to talk about like all of our seasonal plans and all of our post-launch plans yet, but I will say this, uh, that we're going to be having a lot of like really rich and interesting content updates for our, our seasonal players, but we're still be making balance changes and adding new plans uh, to adding, attract like, people new, to keep like, playing that don't want to and, play like, the game. items and things of that nature for players who are playing in the Eternal Realm, the place where uh, you will be able to never no? have to worry about like a character reset okay. or do any of those things. Uh, there will always be new infusions of some game content at that level uh, to players going in that space. Cool. But for the richest experience uh, in the post-launch environment, I would highly recommend checking out Seasons because we're doing some really, really cool stuff. All right. Um, so one thing that I noticed in the December press beta to the public beta was that changes were made to the skill tree. There were like new passive skills, there were new paths made amongst the passive nodes. So I'm wondering, was the skill tree designed in such a way that uh, you can, over the course of seasons or expansions, add new passive or active skills? Yes. So the skill tree really that we have for Diablo 4 at launch really is just the beginning for these classes. We oh. are going to be looking for new opportunities to create uh, more play styles within each of the classes. We'll be adding new passes, potentially new skills in the future. Uh, these are things that we would like to do. It is likely that the, the, uh, these kinds of updates, particularly of like new passives, like new nodes, new things in the skill tree, are more likely to happen as part of our like a uh, like our future larger larger like expansion size updates, rather, rather than things might be happening as part of seasons. Okay. We have lots of interesting customization options we're going to be adding as part of seasons, uh, but they might not touch the skill tree specifically. Okay. Oh, um, we've been seeing this question a lot. I've been seeing it in chat as well, and there's, I, I think, some confusion in regards to alters of Lilith, mm. how those will work in between uh, seasons. And, so or, yes you and know, no. I, will yeah. those reset? Like, how does that specifically work? Sure. Uh, so alters of Lilith are one of the uh, the features that players can go and uh, collect basically in the uh, the overall that we're going to contribute to their their renown uh, total within each of the zones. Well, and give permanent par character power as well. well I'm going to get there. Okay. So there's two purposes really that the alters of Lilith have. They have this uh, this this larger collectible feature where you want to kind of go get all of them uh, for the uh, for the um, for the stat points that you just called out. Yeah. And then they also provide uh, the renown. So renown is reset on a seasonal basis. So when you start a new character. Uh, your renown score goes back down to zero. You'll have to go and finish side dungeons, go do side quests, uh, go do uh, go find alters of Lilith, go do these things, or to kind of get that uh, that renown back up to unlock all of those benefits. Now you don't need to go do all of that content in a zone to to max out your renown bar. There's actually way more activities that grant renown than you actually need to complete in order to finish yeah, going through and fi filling up the uh, all of the renown and getting all five tiers of the rewards. Uh, when it comes to the stat gain, so basically to your point that you're just speaking about, alters of Lilith also have another purpose. And that when you find one, they give you a stat boost that's supposed to apply to your character and all characters in that realm. Uh, the way that that's going to work is that once you've collected that stat boost from an, a specific altar of Lilith, uh, that stat effect is going to propagate out to other characters of that game type. So basically, Hardcore is going to have its own uh, progression for this, where it's like if you were playing a Hardcore character on, at launch and you go and you do all these things, those stat, uh, those stat boosts you collect will propagate to your Hardcore characters you would make in the Seasonal Realm. And the same is true for players who are playing in the, uh, the, uh, the normal realm and playing the normal game mode. Uh, the, all the, uh, the stat boosts they're unlocking via the Alters of Lilith will also unlock for their seasonal characters in the future. But if the hardcore character dies... don't need to go and collect keep every right. Alters of Lilith with every new season, but you do want to get some of them. They do still grant experience, and they do give you uh, some uh, bonus towards your, keep uh, yeah. boost towards your renown. But there's not the sense that you need to go and like do every single one of them every single time. We want that to be a really fun experience for players uh, to engage with, particularly while they're exploring Sanctuary for their first couple times at most, you know, and, and have that uh, have that bit of fun. Otherwise, players can choose to 
engage with them or ignore them as they go into their seasonal playthroughs in the future. Can you right. reset them? So characters, uh, you will, if you unlock a permanent stat boost in season one, that will persist into season two. That's correct. So like, right. uh, with regards is to it going to be possible to completely start a hardcore tied. character from base if you unlock them all? Slots. Said that? Is there any other kind of item types where either you can only get this item in this zone, this location, or is there some greater propensity for some items to drop off Beast certain core. monsters know, right? or something like that? So we have a number of different uh, creatures in the game that have a chance to drop particular things. Uh, world bosses, for example, have a, a really, really good chance to drop Scattered Prism, which is the crafting material you need in order to add sockets to items in the game. Uh, and then there are certain content types that have the, uh, the chance to, uh, to grant certain materials, like Fiend Rose, for example, really only shows up in Helltide areas. And the only way to level, uh, raise the level of your glyph is by going through and doing Nightmare Dungeons. When it comes to item farming, uh, we also, and I've talked a little bit about this in the past, but I think it's, a, uh, it's good to remind people, and also just to continue talking about it, right, because it's a new mechanic. And that is that when you're fighting creatures of a, cer a certain monster family, like zombies or skeletons for their respective families, uh, those monsters have a higher chance to drop certain kinds of items. It's actually a bonus chance to drop certain item types kind of happening in the background. So it's not like if an item, like for example, uh, skeletons have a high chance, have a chance rather, not high chance. They have a chance to drop crossbows, irrespective of your class. So you're playing a barbarian, which can't use crossbows, it's one of its, its weapon types. And you could be killing all these skeletons and you might just get a, a crossbow drop as a result of that. That's tradable with rogues, you know, there's other things you can do with that. But that's, that's not taking a, a roll from the skeleton. It could drop everything else in addition to that crossbow. It's like an extra bonus thing that uh, that skeleton can drop. Okay. Every monster family has a few different things they drop this way. So as players are going through the experience, and particularly while they're leveling up in the campaign, they'll occasionally start saying like, oh, I'm, I'm getting like a lot of like rings from this, or I'm getting a lot of boots from this, or I'm getting a lot, and they'll realize that over time, uh, uh, they'll realize over the course of time that these are being dropped based on the monster families they're, uh, they're engaging with. So as players discover more of this, and they continue to fight more monsters and start mapping some of these things out, they will uncover the right areas or the best areas potentially to farm for certain kinds of things. And that includes like unique items as well. So if you're looking for a unique crossbow, maybe it behooves you to try to fight a lot of skeletons because you know they have a chance to drop crossbows in addition to other things. So these are the sorts of things that like as you're diving deeper into like the hunting gameplay, the item hunting gameplay, these are things to look at. That's not the end. There's a lot more we're going to be doing as the game continues to mature and as we're going into like our post-launch period. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll talk about that when the time's right. Fair enough. Um, this one is kind of tied to some of the server slam stuff that we just announced, mm -hmm. which is, uh, will there be any additional changes made to the game after the server slam weekend, like what was done during the beta? No. The, I mean, we announced that the game has gone gold. Uh, the server slam is you're testing a version of the game that is uh, very close to the launch version of the game. That's that's why it's so effective as a server slam. Um, now, of course, as a live service game, um, we're going to be continuing to take feedback exactly like you saw during the beta, during the during the uh, you know after the game has launched, and making changes and making improvements based on on data and player feedback. Awesome. All right, overlay map versus mini map. Mini map is a little map in the top right corner. Overlay is what we had in the past in D two, where you have this semi transparency of the the large scale map over your actual gameplay. D4 does not have an overlay map. A lot of people are asking for it. What's the, uh, what's the reason for no overlay? Yeah, so when you're playing through a, I miss that a, big an action time. RPG and you're playing through that core loop, you're basically switching between two modes of behavior, right? You're killing monsters or you're navigating. Mm -hmm. And you're switching back and forth between those really quickly. And so it can be helpful to have that be as fast as possible so that you can, can I just kill those monsters. Okay, where am I going to go? Is there an objective to the left or right? right? And so the overlay map is very effective at doing that. Um, in fact, it's so effective that it's up all, that there's no reason to ever close it. Um, and so there are a lot of solutions that we've seen um, different games do in terms of like trying to mitigate um, sort of its effects on combat uh, in terms of uh, fading areas around the player or, or other things like that. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep the, the combat and navigation spaces as clean as possible um, by separating them a little bit more. And so that's why you see the mini-map, you see uh, the pin system on the map, um, you see uh, in cer certain cases uh, edge of screen indicators on the mini-map. Um, we want to add more of those kinds of things. Um, but ultimately, you know, our goal is to make sure that players um, when they're going back and forth between combat mode and navigation mode, that they have the tools that they need to do it efficiently. Except the best like tool, huge, like you just said. Um, hassle. So we're going to be continuing to look at this feedback. Um, we 
our, 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 uh, for launch, um, you know, you won't have an overlay map. We're trying to make that experience as smooth as possible. Um, but we're going to conti continue to listen to player feedback on this point. So give us an overlay map. That's what the players um, want. We have a question saying, are Make all it an option. Let them decide. floor iterations with halls like traversing, or are we going to get like maybe multi-level dungeons or anything uh, that uh, brings like elevation or depth and so forth into those? So you that know, was so weird. Interesting that uh, one of the things that we did in Diablo 4 um, that's really cool is that um, you don't have to load between dungeon floors. Um, an interesting effect of that is that um, you might not always notice when you're going down a floor into a lower floor. There is a, you know, there are staircases and, and there are sort of moments where, where that shows up and there's UI uh, that appears that shows up. Um, but in many cases, our dungeons do have multiple floors and because it's so seamless, you don't always notice. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, when you think back to Diablo 1 and adventuring down through the cathedral and it's this very uh, deep, uh, deep dungeon, um, our dungeon tech can certainly do that too, and that's um, certainly something that uh, could be a cool option for the future. Awesome. All right. With regards to PvP, is there any kind of instancing to separate out solo players versus groups, or are we going to see like four-man squads ganking lonely players? Yeah, you will see four-man squads ganking lonely <laughs> players. <laughs> I I want to I, I want to make sure I really I'm really clear about this. Uh, the, the fields of hatred that we have in Diablo 4 are not a place for honor, uh, they're a place for slaughter. Uh, so if you go into those spaces, you need to be mindful that you are entering a, a chaotic realm of, of danger and threat. That's the fantasy. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, now, players who go into these spaces might also uh, be fortunate and find that there's a number of other players that are trying to uh, peacefully farm up you know, uh, in various resources uh, while they're fighting there and not actually be interested in engaging in PvP immediately. You know, that also is a situation you might occasionally find yourself in. Maybe you, try, maybe you decide that you want to take advantage of them, and you show up and decide that you want to go and, and gank those players and take their things. You know, it's, it's, it, greed gets the best of us all at some point in time. But I want to make it really clear that there is, there is some, uh, there, is some, there are th uh, things in place in terms of how we bucket players by level and things like that mm. to ensure that you're not always be going up against like really, really high level players at a very, very low level. You know, but in terms oh. of like, I'm walking in this space, is there any guarantee that there aren't three people and uh, some more roaming around uh, this area looking to gank? But there is going like to be, there, there are uh, going to the be some there restrictions. There is no mechanic in place. I wasn't expecting that. that. So you need to be mindful of that when you're walking around here. I uh, go in there with friends. Uh, or, Interesting. Or, or walk in and be prepared to occasionally die. You know, um, especially when you immediately walk into a field of hatred, if you were to immediately get uh, killed by other players, there's actually no real penalty for you in that case. Now, you haven't started to acquire any of the, uh, the, the PvP resources in that zone yet anyway. So they have nothing to gain from killing, and you have nothing to lose as a result of that death. So, yeah, things to experiment with, but you know, going with the right set of expectations. <laughs> so he's like, but so no one would ever kill someone in that situation. Like they have nothing to gain, so why would they kill you, right? I mean, I'm just going to leave you alone. It's going to be occur. fine. I would It'll add be too fine. That the, um, People don't just do that, are right? Fairly large areas. Yes. So yeah. um, you're not fine. There are some some tools to avoid, uh, you know, uh, the same group of players repeatedly killing you. There are also two two fields of hatreds. So you can move between fields of hatred, mm -hmm. and there are uh, things like elixirs um, the, uh, that can allow you to be more evasive or um, get away from situations where you feel like you're at a disadvantage. Um, or um, there are also, when you think about um, uh, the fields of hatred mechanic, you're get, collecting these. Uh, oh, hardcore characters uh, don't permit die in PvP. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're said refining that. them so that you can turn them in for, for rewards. Um, the locations that you can do that, there are several locations, uh, typically active at a time. So you can sort of do some strategizing about where there might be enemy players and where it might be safe. There's going to be That's enemy right. players when one, everywhere. When a, uh, an altar is being used to purify those shards of hatred into red dust, you'll actually see a notification on your map to let you know where that's actually occurring. So if you see that there's a lot of activity in the northwestern part of the, uh, the zone, maybe that's a great time to sneak over to the southeastern side mm -hmm. and try to uh, quietly and quickly uh, cleanse some, shard, uh, some red dust of your own. Because once it's cleansed, you can't lose it. You don't drop it. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I, we have a, a lot of uh, questions related to, like, Seasonal stuff and battle pass stuff. I just want to note that we actually are uh, our next live stream uh -huh. uh, yeah. in uh, in May, in early soon. May, soon, uh, soon, soon, uh, soon. TM will be uh, 
uh, actually focusing a little bit on our seasonal structure as well as uh, battle pass and so forth. So we're actually going to leave those comments specifically for that. I, I want to know about the battle the monitor pass. and the people in production behind me. Keep going, Adam, what's wrong with you? That's just me. Um, in regards to other quick questions that we do have, um, uh, I'm going to just lightening off a few questions that have been coming up. Uh, one, these are kind of related, I would say, but well, one is a co-op on PC. Uh, have we looked at doing something like that? Uh, and then separately, mouse and keyboard on console. Is that something that we've also looked into? Uh, no couch co-op on PC, no mouse and keyboard on console. There you go. That was easy. <laughs> um, uh, mainly because, I, it, as you guys know, PC... Is PvP uh, mandatory? Like the, no. The account no. structure on Battlenet and, and having two accounts at if the same If you go time into PvP on areas, PC is a little difficult. get the Lilith um, statues. And then on console, re right now it's just... Uh, Apparently you can go play, in and like not um, be attacked and, or something, you know, unless you attack other people. As we get past launch and so forth, we'll look at more into feedback and everything from that end. I guess last question from me. You uh, said you won't have to play PvP system, if you don't want to. Can we expect that really. to be something that is um, built up to be more robust over time with regards to either seasons or, again, expansions? Oh, yes. So uh, Diablo 4 is a game about collecting, killing monsters, collecting loot, uh, screwing around with that loot to do fun things and make it do, uh, uh, get more performance out of it, modifying those things, looking for the right ethics. Uh, yeah, we're going to absolutely continue to be like just changing some of the crafting options, modifying them, providing new options that don't exist right now, building upon things we already have in place. You can expect to see a lot of things. Like Diablo 4 is a live service because it's, it's a rich bed of opportunities to continue to like refine, change, update, you know, and, uh, and, and modify the systems we have in place right now. So yeah, you'll, you'll definitely see more crafting features over the course of time. Awesome. Um, Last few small questions. Uh, people have been asked about ray tracing uh, because we mentioned the NVIDIA DLSS3 uh, uh, will be coming, coming in. The, the, the service land ray tracing is coming after launch. Uh, it's something that we had talked about earlier. Um, and uh, let's see. This is an interesting question. If you're on your mount, can you actually uh, do, like, pick up uh, crafting materials and stuff like that? Uh, while you're on your mount in, in, in the overworld? Uh, there are a number of simple uh, actions you can perform when you're on your mount. I believe right now you can pick up herbs when you're on, when you're mounted. Yes. Cool. Cool. Uh, I'm trying to okay. see if we have, the chat's moving incredibly fast. A lot of people are talking about WASD movement right now. We don't have any plans for incorporating that. That's something that we may look into post-launch or whatnot from, from our end. Um, Cool. I think uh, we, we got a decent amount of questions in, talked about this, uh, the, uh, the, the beta learnings and, of course, uh, all the uh, information about Endgame. And the server slam. And the server slam. Ashiba server slam. Yeah. Yeah. On, uh, you mentioned WASD movement. So, no, WASD movement will not be in the game at launch. Um, but uh, in the server slam, do check out the additional um, control customization options that we added. Yes. Uh, they are referenced on the blog. And we want to continue to... Um, add more uh, ways to, to customize the control scheme in the way that you're thinking of. So something, exactly. something that we're thinking about for the future. Exactly. Um, so thank you guys again, and thank you, Riker, for, for joining us this week. I know uh, you've had an a opportunity to play through the game uh, quite a lot. We've, we've just stuck him in a room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's really just played the game a ton this week. Um, but we really appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, for the D Diablo 4 developer update live stream. I wonder how much uh, you're going to let him talk our about. Our next it. live stream will be sometime in May, uh, early May, and we'll be talking a little bit about our season structure as well as our battle pass. Um, and a few other things that we did want to call out on in terms of uh, Diablo 3, um, we have season 28 currently going on right now. Yep. Uh, it's an awesome season. Highly recommend checking check it, it out, out. Yeah, check it if out. You, if you haven't. Um, and then, of course, with Diablo Immortal, uh, they just came out with a big update uh, about a week or two ago uh, that added a new uh, uh, PvP system into the game. Uh, so make sure to check that out if you, if you haven't as well. For Diablo 2, we do want to announce one quick thing as well, uh, which is the Diablo 2 Season 4 um, uh, will actually, or Diablo 2 Season 4 will actually begin on May 4th. Um, so we did want to get that out so people can plan their calendars because it's always been a, a, a fun, exciting time within D2R. Well, the D3 season is awesome. Race going, uh, as they kind yep. of uh, get prepped for it, take time off, uh, call off from work. We'll give you a doctor's note. <laughs> it's perfect. So, um, but yes, thank you guys again for uh, tuning in to the Diablo 4 Developer Update live stream. And we really appreciate you guys and appreciate the feedback. And thank you again, Riker. Thank you so for, much for, for joining us. Yeah, yeah. 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 Any parting words from anyone over here? 
Well, yeah. we would like you to slam the server. Yeah, do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You must be level 20. And, uh, uh, you know, we tested, you know, an interesting thing is that we tested the oh, yeah. Ashava fight mm -hmm. at level 20 yep. uh, to make sure that it was doable. Yes. We were pretty sure it was doable, <laughs> but we did want to check to make sure it was doable. Um, they were like, it's, yeah, okay, go it, on. And it's, it is quite challenging. Uh, if you are having a lot of trouble with it, you can always go down to uh, difficulty level. That's true. Uh, you could always go down to World Tier 1. That's right. Yes. Okay. And Woody Joe, we expect you to solo it. Um, so for sure, for sure. And again, uh, you can pre-purchase Diablo 4. Uh, we have a QR code up there. Uh, we have a deluxe and ultimate version uh, that are available uh, for the digital version that can give you early access up to four days uh, before launch. So, yeah. Thank you guys again and really appreciate it. And we, oh yes, one other thing. We are going to be uh, raiding into two Diablo partners, both from YouTube and on Twitch. So make sure to stay, stay on the channel if you want to check them out. And yeah, thank you guys again. Really appreciate it. And thank you from all, everyone on the Diablo team. See ya. Yeah. Okay. So that was that. Was that. Um, I got to admit, there was a lot of good information. There's no question that was kind of pr -y. Applause, please. Um, that was definitely kind of pr -y, but at the same time, like, it was just basically nonstop information. A lot of those answers were non-answers. Like, I think at one, like, the most memorable one was the guy where it's like, oh, yeah, we're going to, you know, possibly expand the skill tree later on and blah, 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 blah. And don't worry, though, none of that will possibly, possibly be, you know, may not be with the skill trees. And it's just like, you just, you just said it, that you were going to expand it later, but that you, you weren't going to expand Also, I really didn't like that overlay map answer. Um, I feel, I feel like the overlay map thing from the, from the way that guy said it, it sounds like they didn't put the overlap, the overlay map in because they want us to have fun their way instead of our way. They were like, yeah, we, we don't think that's fun for you. You're not gonna have fun doing that. We know you, we know you like that more, but we're, we, think, we think this is the right way to do it. And it's like, dude, and what's even weirder is he started that saying that the overlay map's like the best way to do it and then went on to say like, yeah, we're trying to fine tune the best way to do it. And it's like, you just said the best way to do it. Do it that way. Do it the way you said was the best way to do it. Like everyone wants. So it, that, was a, that was strange. Um, and, and the fact is not putting it in, it's just an option, man. Why would you not give players all the options to play the game like they want to? It's just weird. Like I don't, that's one of those things where it's just like, I'm not quite sure what they're thinking with that one. Uh, yeah, hopefully they'll put one in later. I will not be surprised at all if we see one get put in later. Uh, he did actually say that the, what, they were going to keep looking at it or keep getting feedback and stuff like that. So I, I bet you we will see one at some point um, for $10. Anyway, I need to go. Thank you all so much for hanging out. Uh, I will be back this evening for probably some more War Tales because that game is awesome if you haven't checked it out. Uh, tomorrow morning, we're going to be checking out Dead Island 2. Um, taking a little look at that game. And then after that, if we really like Dead Island 2, we'll probably keep playing it. Um, but I also want to finish the Horizon DLC, which we really made a lot of headway in today. I want to see I want to see the end of the Horizon DLC. So we're going to be doing that tomorrow. And then probably more War Tales 2. Um, and then as we move into the weekend, we've got all sorts of like little indies that have come out to check out. We've got we got a lot of things that we can do. We got a lot of options. So and War Tales is has completely enveloped me. And we clearly have a long, a long way to go with that game, especially at the way that I'm playing it. So yeah, yeah, a lot of fun stuff. Last note before I go, uh, please keep in mind, if you do want to get one of our awesome Julia Design 10 year anniversary shirts, the black and white versions now in extra, extra large sizes are available at code.tv slash store. They're only here until Sunday. So they're after, after Sunday at the Cozy Stream, they're gone, they're gone. That is going to be the, the last time they are sold. So if you do want to pick one up before Sunday at code.tv slash store. Also, we got awesome mouse mats and zip up hoodies now. They're pretty badass. Go check him out. All right, friends. I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much for being here. See you tonight. Bye-bye.